what we're going to be looking at this morning is transliteracy and as I say the first part of this is going to be um, a pretty straightforward um, talk from me. Um, so we'll begin with the definition of transliteracy. Um, so transliteracy is, as we have defined it here at the IOCT, is the ability to read, write and interact across a range of platforms, tools and media from signing and orality through to handwriting, print, TV, radio, film to digital social networks. Now as a behaviour, this isn't new, it reaches back to the very beginning of culture. But it's only been identified as a working concept since the internet allowed humans to communicate in ways which do seem entirely new. Um, as a notion, it's really grown up here in the IOCT. We've had a group called PART, Production and Research in Transliteracy. And in 2007, we ran quite a few events here developing the idea. Um, we see it as an open source concept and we offer it up for you to think about, develop, write about, um, go to Wikipedia and argue about the definition. Um, you know, it's growing all the time. Um, last year we published an article in Transliteracy in uh, First Monday, which we saw as our kind of flag in the sand for transliteracy. So um, the, the, the eight of us, um, well, eight including Howard Ryan Gold, seven writers, um, struggled to collaborate to produce one document that represented what seven of us thought. Um, and again, that's our kind of flag in the sand. It's not definitive, it's just a starter document. Um, so the word transliteracy is derived from the verb to transliterate, which means to write or print a letter or word using the closest corresponding letters of a different alphabet or language. And of course, this is nothing new, but our interpretation extends the act of transliteration and applies it to an increasingly wide range of communication platforms and tools. So, um, as it describes here, from the very earliest days when uh, people could just use kind of body language and grunts, um, right through to handwriting, print, TV and film, and then through to network digital media, we think the concept of transliteracy calls from a change of perspective, away from the battles over whether print is better than digital, etc., etc., and a move instead towards a unifying ecology, not just of media, but of all kinds of literacies relevant to reading, writing, interaction and culture, both now, in the past and in the future. So we hope it's an opportunity to cross some quite difficult divides. And since in the IOCT we specialise in mixing people up from different disciplines, different cultures, ways of thought, transliteracy is a useful notion to have in your head. Um, just briefly, it actually was predated by the plural term transliteracies, transliteracies, um, which comes from the Transcriptions Research Project directed by Professor Alan Liu at the Department of English at the University of California, Santa Barbara. So I went to his conference, which was about transliteracies in relation to reading new media. Um, came home and thought transliteracy was a great word, looked it up and found that it didn't exist. Um, so it does now. So let's have a look at some notions of transliteracy. These are the Chauvet horses. They were painted in the Chauvet caves in France around 32,000 years ago. The first evidence of writing appeared in Sumeria and Egypt around 3,000 years ago, by which time we'd already had cities on the planet for 7,000 years. So, 7,000 years of city, cities with, as far as we know, no writing. How do you have a city with no writing? Transliteracy asks, how were people remembering and communicating for the thousands of years in between? And what are the similarities with the ways that we communicate today? Or to put it another way, has our addiction to print made us forget skills that we had before? And then to ask, can digital media reconnect us with those skills again? So I'm not advocating that um, we all forget uh, our ability to read and write or that nobody else learns. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying that digital technologies have forced us to rethink what it means to be literate. And they've weaned us just ever so slightly away from the hegemony of fixed time. 
For example, it's taken less than a hundred years for us to figure out how to make and watch a talking movie. And today we can make them ourselves and put them on YouTube and we're going to see one that Howard Rheingold made in a while. It's, so it, there are lots of things that are easy to do now, but do we really understand the implications of them? An ongoing debate within um, the, the part research group focuses on the ways in which transliteracy differentiates itself from other kinds of um, literacy definitions. So here are a couple. Ofcom define media literacy as the ability to access, understand and create communications in a variety of contexts. Um, Gilster defines digital literacy as the ability to understand and use information in multiple formats from a wide range of sort sources when it's presented via computers. Just to say, by the way, you don't need to write all this down because I'll give you the presentation afterwards. Henry Jenkins, who I'm sure some of you are familiar with, um, has developed the term um, convergence, generally in relation to media and gaming worlds. Um, he's an MIT scholar, very well known, and he's written, part of the confusion about media convergence stems from the fact that when people talk about it, they're actually describing at least five processes. He lists these types of convergence as technological, economic, social or organic, cultural and global, and concludes that these multiple forms of media convergence are leading us towards a digital renaissance, a period of transition and transformation that will affect all aspects of our lives. And we suggest that transliteracy is the literacy of the process that Jenkins is describing. But it's important to note that transliteracy is not just about computer-based materials, it's about all communication types across time and culture. It doesn't privilege one above the other, but treats all as of equal value and moves between and across them. For example, I have a PhD student, Anyati Isong, who's um, writing about uh, writing in Africa and new media, but we're also talking about drumming and the uses of drumming across Africa. So there are many different types of communication and they should all be taken into account here. In 1964, Marshall McLuhan saw the process that Jenkin describes as a occurring increasingly via technology. McLuhan proposed that in this electric age, we see ourselves being translated more and more into the form of information, moving towards the technological extension of consciousness. And Walter Ong, writing in 1982 about the relationship between literacy and orality, speech, also approached the matter from the point of view of a linear progressive change. So McLuhan said, you know, we are moving in a certain direction. And Walter Ong said, the shift from orality to literacy and onto electronic processing engages social, economic, political, religious, and other structures. But the concept of media ecology, as this is, developed by McLuhan, Ong, Neil Postman, and others, is certainly closely related to transliteracy, but the difference lies in transliteracy's insistence upon a lateral approach to history, context, and culture. Transliteracy's interest in lived experience and its focus on interpretation via practice and production. Transliteracy understands digital media not as part of a linear historical progression, but as manifestations of other similar modes of communication. The ecology of transliteracy is global, historical, and holistic. Now, social media critic Howard Rheingold is visiting professor here at the IOCT, and he'll be speaking, I'm sure you know, at a conference here on the 20th of November. Do sign up if you can come. His work on the history of cooperation is useful in elucidating a context for transliteracy. So I've got um, quite a long quote from him, and we can maybe take this back to this image while, while we think about this. In his book, Technologies of Cooperation, sorry, paper, Technologies of Cooperation, he speculates on the nature of the very earliest collectives. He writes, quote, humans lived as hunter-gatherers in small extended family units long before they lived in agricultural settlements. For most of that time, small game and gathered foods constituted the most significant form of wealth, enough food to stay alive. At some point, larger groups figured out how to band together to hunt bigger game. 
We don't know exactly how they figured this out, but it's a good guess that some form of communication was involved, and however they did it, their banding together process must have solved collective action problems in some way. Our mastodon hunting ancestors must have found ways to suspend mistrust and strict self-interest long enough to cooperate for the benefit of all. It's unlikely that unrelated groups would be able to accomplish huge game hunting whilst also fighting with each other. So very early on there was an imperative to communicate in some form. Eventually, around 40,000 years ago, there was enough leisure time for such communities to record their activities on the walls of their caves. And just 5,000 years ago, they began to write. So get your head around that. 35,000 years of these drawings before they began to write. Um, as Howard Rheingold says, quote, the first forms of writing appeared as a means of accounting for the exchange of commodities such as wine, wheat, or sheep, and the taxation of this wealth by the empire. The master practitioners of the new medium of marks on clay or stone were the accountants for the emperors and their priest administrators. When writing became alphabetic, says McLuhan, an altogether new kind of empire, the Roman Empire, became possible. So across this long stretch of cultural time, five million years of human communication the privilege of reading and writing as primary defining literacies begins to seem somewhat out of scale. Rheingold says, what we're witnessing today is the acceleration of a trend that has been building for thousands of years. When technologies like alphabets and internets amplify the right cognitive or social abilities, old uh, capabilities, old trends take new twists and people build things that could never be built before. The ways in which people manage different media and modes of communication in their everyday lives is of great interest to the transliteracy <coughs> researcher. In his 1981 paper, The Ethnography of Literacy, ethnographer John Sved called for research into what he called the social meaning of literacy on the grounds that, quote, the stunning fact is that we do not fully know what literacy is. The assumption that it's simply a matter of the skills of reading and writing doesn't even begin to approach the fundamental problem, what are reading and writing for? The emergence of Web2 technologies since then has only intensified this challenge and transliteracy encourages us to adapt Sved's statement and ask, what are reading 2.0 and writing 2.0 for? What are they for? Writing in 1998, Bruce Mason, who has worked here until recently in the Transliteracy Group, argued that research into commu computer-mediated communication has begun to challenge, or CMC as we call it, has begun to challenge much of the scholarship in the orality and literacy debate. This is not to suggest that transliteracy is restricted to Web2, but rather to suggest that we can use the plethora of new media devices and affordances to view what might be called ancient practices in a 21st century light. So it should be possible to adapt Sved's call for ethnographies of literacy into an examination of, quote from Mason, the roles these abilities play in social life, the varieties of reading and writing available for choice, the contexts of their performance, the manner in which they interpreted and tested, not by experts, but by ordinary people in ordinary activities. We need ethnographies of transliteracy, and in the workshop you're going to be doing a kind of mini ethnography of transliteracy. We need studies of its social, cultural and power relationships, and of its network vernacular from the perspectives of those who live and work within it. Now I've got some numbers I won't uh, bore you with, but um, what they kind of um, compile is that according to the CIA fact book, which defines a literate person as someone who is over 15 and can read and write, according to their figures, 18% of people in the world are illiterate because they, they can't read and write and they're over 15. But surely that doesn't mean that they have no other literacies. So then we can look at these people, Karaka Indians. 
a couple of modern Karaka Indians in their traditional attire. This photograph was taken in 2005 during the first Aboriginal social forum in Campinas, Brazil. Textual literacy has become so ingrained in Western society that it's reached the point of invisibility. We're so used to being able to read and write in our society, we don't even think about it. It's, it's an invisible skill. But humans have only been using reading and writing for a very short time. And in tribes like this, culture is learned and passed on not via books, but via an interwoven accretion of images and stories. The Ashaninka tribe say, quote, everything we use has a story. Each drawing is a long and comprehensive story. Each drawing which is passed from one generation to another is our writing. Each little symbol is in itself an immense story. As one learns a drawing, one learns its origin, who taught it and who brought it to us. The philosopher Socrates, who eschewed learning to read and write in a culture where such practices were unusual anyway, believed that the fixed nature of writing limits thought and inquiry. In the Phaedrus we read that in 370 BC, Socrates asserted that <coughs> writing was an aid, quote, not to memory, but to reminiscence, providing, quote, not truth, but just the semblance of truth. Readers would, he said, quote, be hearers of many things, but they will have learned nothing. They will appear to be omniscient and will generally know nothing. They will be tiresome company, having the show of wisdom without the reality. Of course, it's impossible to ignore the fact that Plato wrote down everything Socrates said. Otherwise, we wouldn't know this. But what happened was that, that they would talk and under the, a plane tree by the banks of the Alyssas. Plato would write down what Socrates said, and that's how we know these things. But of course, that's probably not exactly true, as, as Socrates points out. But it's interesting to place those complaints about reading and writing alongside the charge of graphocentrism currently being leveled at Western agencies engaged in trying to colonize societies such as the Ashaninka. Marilda Cavalcanti, writing about the Ashaninka, observes, quote, the Ashaninka traditional form of education includes planting rituals and living in communion with nature, and school and schooling are just a small part of the whole discussion on public policies. As the indigenous teachers say all the time, they are teachers full time, all day long, wherever they are. They go out hunting and fishing with their students and families. And the Ashaninka recognize the importance of literacy, but not its supremacy. So they assign the use of literacy to certain nominated individuals. They say, quote, as our traditional system of life doesn't internally depend on writing, we're educating just a few people who can then make contact with other societies on our behalf. We're also educating teacher researchers to record our history, to get them involved in, in politics, to get them to help us maintain the cultural world of the people, making old and young people aware, and opening up an issue of reflection about writing. But we don't want to override our culture. Um, through school, they say we also work with drawings and maps regarding territorial control because for us it's new to work within a delimited territory. So their territory is being carved up into maps, which is something that's totally unfamiliar to them. So they have to learn how to read maps. But this reference to territories correlates with echo philosopher David Abrams' explanation of the dreaming songs of Australian Aborigines and of their connection to actual features of the landscape. Um, Dreamtime stories are inextricably linked to specific locations, providing, Abrams suggests, an auditory mnemonic or um, memory tool, an oral means of recalling viable routes through an often harsh terrain. Um, just in which, quote, just as the strong song structure carries the memory of how to orient in the land, so the sight of particular features in the land activates the memory of specific songs and stories. So instead of maps, the Dreamtime songs will have embedded in them all of the landmarks that you need to know to get from one place to the next, 
and, and then when you actually reach each one of those landmarks, it will trigger in you, if you like, the, the kind of particular songs and stories that relate to that. So you're mapping your way through the landscape via songs and landmarks. Um, Robert Lawler writes that in the Aboriginal worldview, every meaningful activity, event or life process that occurs at a particular place leaves behind a vibrational residue in the earth as plants leave an image of themselves as seeds. He writes that the shape of the land, its mountains, rocks, riverbeds and water holes and its unseen vibrations echo the events that brought that place into creation. Everything is a symbolic footprint of the metaphysical beings whose actions created our world. As with a seed, the potency of an earthly location is wedded to the memory of its origin. And then Abraham adds to that, Given this radical interdependence between the spoken stories and the sensible landscape, the ethnographic practice of writing down oral stories and then printing them and publishing them must be seen as a particular form of violence wherein the stories are torn away from the land, the landforms and the topographic features that materially embody and pervade them. And that's something you really need to think about for a moment. These stories are oral stories and songs with a purpose. They are maps in your head and on the landscape. And then ethnographers will go and say, tell me that story, sing me that song, I'll record it, I'll write it up, I'll take it away. But in their view, it has no meaning because it has to be told. You know, this story must be told under this tree. If you don't tell it under this tree, it has no meaning. Um, and I find that very interesting in terms of new media with tagging and how tags kind of have a similar uh, function. Um, so um, I was thinking about that in terms of um, Google Maps and in terms of Flickr. Um, in the transliterate life world, a Flickr image is understood not as an isolated event, not just as a picture, but it's in conjunction with the user's knowledge about what Flickr is. What prompted that person to post that photo? Why 16 people who maybe they don't know left comments about that photo? What kind of tags people put on that photo? You know, it, it starts to serve that same purpose. Um, it's not just a photo collecting technology, but it's the equivalent of the tree in the Dreamtime story. It has vibrational residues which the transliterate user can pick up and read. So if you understand how Flickr works, you understand all of those different components. Um, finally, on the topic of Australian Aboriginal people, I recently came across a story about the Walpiri tribe who used YouTube to make a protest to the local police. Ethnologist Kimberly Christian wrote, quote, check it out. Walpiri men at Lajamanu have recorded and posted a video up on YouTube about recent events during which a female police officer went onto men's ceremonial grounds, which they shouldn't do. Their critique is lodged in the cultural protocols and the law that surrounds gender-specific ceremonies. The fact that they're making their complaint and their call for police to understand their law on YouTube marks a new mode of communication with, or at least an attempt at communication with, police and the wider non-Aboriginal public. And it looks like the police were listening. They're going to apologize and meet with the community about the incident. So, you know, in the old days, if you want to complain to the police, you probably had to fill in some forms and write an account. Now you make a YouTube video if you can't read and write, and hopefully it will have the same impact. So how can we make connections between people who don't read and write and those with cultures where print literacy is embedded? Transliteracy may provide a set of concepts which link them together. For example, new media critic Catherine, N. Catherine Hales believes that we're in the midst of a shift in cognitive styles, which she sees as generational. I, I don't, but um, this is what she says in, in a paper which I don't think it's published yet. She says, the shift in cognitive styles can be seen in the contrast between deep attention and hyperattention. Deep attention is the cognitive style generally associated with the humanities and it's characterised by concentrating on a single object for long periods, say a novel by Charles Dickens. So you ignore outside stimuli whilst you're reading. Um, you prefer a single stream of information 
and you have a high tolerance for long focus times. Hyperattention, by contrast, and looking at these guys, <coughs> is characterized by switching focus rapidly between different tasks, preferring multiple information streams, seeking a high level of stimulation, having a low tolerance for boredom. She says the contrast in the two cognitive modes may be captured in an image. Picture a college sophomore, deep in pride and prejudice, with her legs draped over an easy chair, oblivious to her ten-year-old brother sitting in front of a console, jamming on a joystick while he plays Grand Theft Auto. And what she's saying is that these are two different cognitive modes and each has diff advantages and limitations. So she says deep attention is great for solving complex problems represented in a single medium, but it comes at the price of environmental alertness and flexibility of response. You're so immersed in it, you don't notice what's going on around you. Hyperattention excels at negotiating rapidly changing environments in which multiple foci compete for attention. But its disadvantage is its impatience with focusing for long periods on non-interactive objects such as the Victorian novel or a complicated maths problem. So she goes on to say in an evolutionary context, thinking back to the Karaka Indians and their way of life, hyperattention must have developed first. You have to respond quickly when you're, you know, in the forest, as it were. And deep attention, she says, is a relative luxury. And it requires group cooperation to create a secure environment in which you don't <coughs> have to be constantly alert to impending dangers. So she thinks this is a generational issue, but I, I don't think so. I can see similarities between the gamers and tribes like the Ashaninka or the Karaka. Um, the, the, the gamers have learned to use hyperattention for gameplay. The latter use it to hunt food and stay alive. <coughs> Um, but I don't think this is about generation, I think it's about culture. <coughs> so transliteracy is an inclusive concept which bridges and connects past and present and hopefully future modalities. The chit chat on a blog or Twitter isn't so different to campfire stories after a day's hunting. The auction fever of eBay is not unlike the haggling in an Iron Age mar marketplace. The literacies they all use, digital, numerate, oral, may be different, but the transliteracies, social, economic, political, often transect them in similar ways, depending on cultural context. For example, in recent um, years, we've begun to switch from searching for information in encyclopedias, indices and catalogues, to querying the kinds of data collections that existed before books. That is to say, often these days, we ask each other, we ask each other via millions of message boards and chat rooms. We ask for advice about health problems, moral dilemmas, what to cook for dinner. We share those answers, we elaborate on them, and in so doing we aggregate them so that other people we don't know can use them too. Online we're creating enormous networks of knowledge. The cat in the kitchen, synthesis. Philosopher Bernard Stiegler suggests that past technologies have always involved a change in our phenomenological experience of the world. Transliteracy engages with new innovations in participatory media, and even as it recognizes that part of what such media enables is a recovery, um, sorry, even as it recognizes that part of what such media enables is a recovery of an older plurality of literacies with possible ancient beginnings. Stiegler's work draws attention to the degree in which responses to technology are often polarized between anxiety and euphoria. Our sense of transliteracy is, is informed by that relationship and pays attention to the whole range of modes um, and synergies to produce a sense of a transliterate life world in constant process, constantly changes, changing. So to explain to you what a life world is, and again in relation to the IOCT, the IOCT has its own life world, which is actually quite different to life worlds in, in the other faculties that you, you move in. So a life world is the combination of your physical environment and your subjective experience. Agre and Horswell describe how each individual's life world is personal to them, and that's where this picture comes in. 
They say, cats and people can be understood as inhabiting the same physical environment, but different life worlds. Kitchen cupboards, window sills, and the spaces underneath chairs have different significance for cats and people, as do balls of yarn, upholstery, TV sets, and other cats. And a kitchen affords a different kind of life world to a chef than a mechanic, although clearly these life worlds are overlap. <coughs> so a life world is not just a physical environment, but it's the patterned way in which it becomes meaningful with an activity. So here we have, the, I've just found this on Flickr, a cat sitting in a salad bowl. That to a cat seems a perfectly normal way to use a salad bowl. To us, we're not so crazy about the idea. So, you know, we use it, the physical world, if you like, can be seen in the photo, but the life world, the way we understand the space that we're in, varies from person to person. The transliterate life world is very subjective, diverse and complicated. It's not one kind of place, but many. It's an ecology, and it's changing with each edition of each new media type. But a story is still always a story whether it's told walking down the street between friends, printed in a book, or tweeted across the internet. So I'm coming on to the last part of the talk now, looking at what are the patterned ways of the complex life world of transliteracy, and how are they meaningful. And the IOCT, I stress again, is very much designed to hopefully create this. Transliteracy happens in the places where different things meet, mix, and rub together. It's an interstitial space, teeming with diverse life forms like you, some on the rise, some in decline, expressed in many languages, in many voices, many kinds of scripts and media. It's a world where print does have a place, but not the only place. <coughs> One way in which we might create an image of the patterns of our life worlds is to map them via the networks we form and the ways in which we move around them. And when we get to the um, uh, workshop part, I'm going to ask you to actually, I'll tell you this now so you can be thinking about it, to actually draw, using the flip charts, to draw some maps, transliteracy maps of the IOCT, which will combine the physical space with the mental or psychogeographic space. And this um, diagram, I think, will probably help you think about it. So. It's quite a leap to take you from the cat sitting in the bowl and phenomenology to take you to social science and the idea of networks. But if you combine the two, you might be able to create a, a visual image of transliterate space. Now, this diagram is a diagram of structural holes um, devised by Professor Ronald Burt, who's a social scientist and an expert in uh, networks. Um, and if we just look at it here, I'll just read it out as I show you where these things are. He proposes that people who have connections across the spaces between networks, and here we have this guy Robert, he's connected to that network and that network, that that kind of person um, well, well, is more prone to have good ideas, so this person will have good ideas more often than James, who's kind of embedded in the network over here. For example, in this, in this diagram, Robert and James are both in the same network, but Robert is traveling across to other networks and James is not. Um, he says, Robert is an entrepreneur in the literal sense of the world, a person who adds value by brokering connections between others. He says there is a tension here, but it's not the hostility of combatants, it's just uncertainty. <coughs> He also says at one point that somebody like Robert will probably earn more money than somebody like James by the virtue of the fact that they will go back and forth across this space. Now, what often happens in terms of innovation and creativity is that the people here in Robert's organisation think that Robert's actually a pretty creative and imaginative guy. But actually what often happens is that Robert treks over here um, sees what people are doing, sees they're doing something he hasn't known about before, says that's a brilliant idea, takes it back to this network and says, why don't we do X? And everybody says, hey, Robert's such a creative and imaginative guy. But actually, all he's doing is moving ideas around, moving across what um, Ronald Burt calls the structural holes between networks 
and bringing new ideas. Now obviously, if he moves back and forth here very often, um, eventually this hole will close up because the two organisations will be sharing ideas so frequently that the hole disappears. So Ronald Burt says two things. One is, um, you should always be looking out for new holes that are opening up, because that's where the innovation happens. <coughs> and secondly, if you can't see any new holes, make them. And again, that's very much, if you like, what the IOCT is designed to do. The IOCT sits here. So that's where the understanding of transliteracy comes into play. Because essentially, Ronald Burt describes this space as structural whole, and I think the use of the word whole is a negative and a wrong word. It, there's lots of stuff in this whole, and I would say that what's here is transliteracy. All different kinds of mixing up, uh, uh, mashups. And also there are people who actually sit inside this whole. And I've got somebody here that I've called Jill, because the people in these diagrams are nearly always men. So here's Jill sitting in the middle. Now Jill does not belong to any of these networks. Jill is comfortable right here in this space. Jill is most fluent in this space. Although it's risky, it's messy to a big degree, it's uncertain, it's always changing, this is where Jill feels most comfortable. And it's probably Jill who's introduced Robert as he passes through the space over here. It's probably Jill who makes Robert's life a bit easier as he travels around. But he doesn't really belong in the transliterate space. He can cope with it. He finds it interesting, but he prefers to be, you know, back home in his own network. So you can see how the IOCT has been deliberately created to fill this space, if you like, to create the space between, you might say this is computer science engineering, art and design and humanities, and here we are in the middle. And you yourselves are being trained to inhabit this transliterate space. That should make sense, I think, probably, when you think about what you've been doing. So, yes, yeah, structural holes is a really helpful concept, but we also need to be thinking about the transliterate space. So, um, what else do I want to say to you? Just to kind of summarise that up before we, we look at the, the video. Um, <coughs> here we go, back again to the definition of transliteracy. In conclusion, it appears that transliteracy might provide a unifying perspective on what it means to be literate in the 21st century. It's not a new behaviour, but it is a new synthesis. Just as in the 60s, the concept of saving the environment provided a way to elaborate around an enormous range of topics and eventually turned into the concept of ecology, so I think transliteracy can do the same for us, for the people who are struggling to deal with the impact of digital communications on our lives. So we live in a world of multiple literacies, just to sum up. Multiple media, multiple demands on our attention, each of these is uh, uh, complete in itself, but we don't experience them one by one. We synthesize them all the time. Each of us every day is involved in staggering acts of comprehension and production. It's only a few thousand years since we sat around fires telling stories to hold back the night, just using sound and gesture. What we do now may draw on technologies that couldn't have been predicted even a few generations ago. Yesterday we were watching a video of Kevin Kelly saying, is it 5,000 days? 5,000 days since the beginning of the internet. No time at all. And what we do now could draw on all kinds of things that are, are, are actually seem very different, but actually are fundamentally very much the same. So we want to offer transliteracy as a tool for thinking with, as an open source idea for you to um, develop. And as you see, we have a website at transliteracy.com where this conversation goes on. Um, so now what I'm going to do is show you a video, a short video of Howard Ryan Gold that he made. And one or two notes about this video that I think you'll find of interest. Howard taught himself how to use video um, last summer. You'll see in the video that there are some fairly kind of clunky points where he's switching, where he's basically <coughs> cutting and editing different pieces of video together. So it's not smooth like TV. But then it's not intended to be because it's him 
being self-taught, using tools to put together a story that he wants to tell. Um, and, and so that kind of, sometimes that lumpiness, bumpiness is part of transliterate work. It isn't, it often is not tidy and perfect because it's always a work in progress. So when we've seen Howard's diagram, uh, Howard's video, I'm going to ask you all to get some paper. We've got some flip chart paper here and there's some over here. We've got some pens over here. And I'd like you to group together with people you don't know and talk about the kind of literacies or the transliteracy that you see going on in here and make a map. And I will be taking photos of all of the maps and, and putting them on the walls so that we can talk about them together. So it's 10 to 11 now. So by 11, that Howard's video is about four minutes, by 11 we'll be ready to do that. Um, and we will do that, we'll take about 20 minutes, so we'll do that from 11 till 20 past and then we'll put them all up on the wall and each group can talk to us about the map that they've made. So what might you draw? Well you might do something like this. I put this up because this is special interest really to the um, Creative Writing and New Media students who've been working on hands this week. Um, this looks like, it, this is meant to be a kind of ancient scroll. Um, but it's actually an artistic rendering of the um, early history of networking and the beginning of the internet. And you'll see what we have here is a person's hand, and this is one of the very first mice, mouse, m mouses or mice, <laughs> computer mouse, the very first one that was ever invented. They've got here, they put together the hand with the mouse, all the names of people who were involved in its development, some, and um, Leonardo-like drawings up here. It's basically the whole kind of concept of what this meant for to create this amazing network, which in 1969, the first packet network. So this is a very much a conceptual map. Or you might decide that you want to draw something like this and draw different networks and connect them up, or something else. Um, we're not using multimedia today, we're just using flip charts and pens, so we're old media. Okay, um, so before I go into the... No, I'm not going to ask you for questions, no, no, we'll do, deal with that later. We'll go into the video now. So hopefully this video will come up, and it's about <coughs> four minutes, and hopefully it'll help you think through what you want to do.